All right, well, this is Dr. Chet Snow at Signs of Destiny 2003 in Tempe, Arizona. We're continuing with our Sunday program, and this afternoon it is my great pleasure to introduce to you Jordan Maxwell. Jordan Maxwell is one of America's foremost researchers and writers and broadcasters in the whole field of uh, religious esotericism, symbols, uh, the stars, looking at our world from different points of view. He was the religion editor for The Truth Seeker out of San Diego for some time, The Truth Seeker being America's oldest metaphysical publication. Its founding was all the way back in 1879, so still going on today. Uh, Jordan at the moment has a radio show, talk radio out of Los Angeles, which is his home, and he is broadcasting and primarily working with television shows and radio at this time. But as I mentioned to you, he is the author of Matrix of Power, the interviews including the ones with Zechariah Sitchin that are on video, and he wrote the preface for this extraordinary book that has given us the title of his talk today, Symbols, Sex, and the Stars. And by that, I do think he means the ones in the sky and not in Hollywood. Thank you, Jordan Maxwell. <clears throat> thank you all. I want to thank Chuck for having me here, and I appreciate the invitation. Uh, before I begin tonight, I have a couple of announcements. First of all, I want to say I'm very honored to have in the audience uh, Sir Lawrence Gardner. I have been impressed with his brilliance and his work, and I'm delighted to have him in my audience. Uh, carry on, Lawrence. So anyway, many, many subjects uh, have interested me in my life. But uh, I would, one of the high points of being able to travel and speak to audiences, uh, one of the few things that I have gotten out of my life's experience is to meet interesting people. And I'd like to pay tribute to three people who have influenced my life greatly. The, probably the most impressive man I have ever personally known and has uh, impacted my life was Mr. Manley Palmer Hall. Manley P. Hall, if you do not know, was one of the most brilliant spiritual men that I have ever even read about. And so I want to pay tribute to Mr. Hall, who is no longer with us. A very wonderful man. Two other people who have influenced me are here with us at this conference. And they have, uh, they have, in fact, uh, impressed me a great deal with their work. And that is Dr. Louis Turi and uh, William Henry. I believe William Henry's work is uh, extraordinary. And there's a lot more to Dr. Louis Turi than meets the eye. He's a brilliant man. Um, <coughs> Unfortunately, so many times that people in this country, especially in Western civilization, <clears throat> they use the term that America is a land of law. This is a country that's based on law. In point of fact, there's nothing could be further from the truth. The entire world is not based on law. The entire world is based on power, period money, political power, and political power is corrupted, and when you concentrate political power, it becomes very corrupt. What we have today in this country is something called consensus reality. Consensus reality is a word you need to think about. <clears throat> we don't have laws in America, we have consensus reality, meaning that the reality that we live by each day we believe to be the law. In point of fact, it is not the law. Too many people have accepted things that they've been told. They haven't done their homework. They don't read. Americans are one of the most illiterate people in the world. They don't read. The problem with America is that 99% of everything that we know <coughs> isn't true. And there's a whole world of occult or hidden knowledge 
that has been hidden from the eyes of the people of the world and has become the property of a handful of people who feel that this kind of legitimate occult knowledge is on a need-to-know basis and they don't figure you need to know. So consequently, and I understand that thinking, but <clears throat> I would suggest that you think about the principle that if you, say, have a two-story building and you're going to put a lot of weight on the second floor, you're going to bring in big computers or printing presses or whatever, uh, the smart thing to do, if you're wise, before you bring in any heavy weight, you might want to go downstairs, get a tall ladder, and hire someone who knows what they're doing, and go up through the ceiling tiles and look at the foundation of the floor you're going to put this weight on to see if it's going to carry it. <clears throat> so what you have done, because of your intelligence, you have you're standing under the foundation you're going to build on. This is the concept of standing under to get understanding. If you don't understand the basis of the things you believe, you're going to be, you're going to be taught all kinds of things. You need to do your homework. You need to go back to the beginning of all things. And do not take anything for granted. It's the poem I hope Mr. Manley Hall once quit that uh, always trust a person looking for the truth. Don't ever trust the one who's found it. Because the universe is not only stranger than you imagine, it's stranger than you can imagine. And one, <clears throat> one lecturer one time made a statement that stuck with me. He says, if you can discuss with a large audience something about God so that everyone can understand what you're saying and that would prove conclusively that you don't know anything because any God that your pea brain ignorant ill-informed unread intellect can understand cannot be that great power that has divinely ordained the universe what you need to understand is we have no comprehension at all of the divine the world is far, far bigger and deeper than you suspect. Our lineage as humans go back hundreds of thousands, and if Michael Kramer is right, perhaps even millions of years. We're discovering now <coughs> civilizations that have existed for probably hundreds of thousands of years that we just were not privy to know about. I believe that these are the days in which the Bible calls the days of the meeting out of justice. What goes around comes around. And it's a time in which the, the powers of the universe are going to enlighten mankind whether they're ready or not. <clears throat> and I'm, unfortunately, I don't think there are too many people in the world who are ready for the very near future that's coming. Again, I... <clears throat> I have always been interested in words, terms, symbols, emblems, because I think that's the way the spirit communicates with us, is with symbols. Uh, the Romans, the ancient Romans had a, <coughs> had a, uh, a saying in their law that said, quote, let them who wish to be deceived be deceived. Quite simply, the Roman law was, if you're so stupid to want to be deceived, go ahead. <laughs> if you had any brains at all, you'd do your homework and take many, many days and hours, uh, the kind of thing that uh, Sir Lawrence Gardner does. Spend a lot of time researching, studying, and then you're going to find out, yes, what we're faced with in this world is consensus reality. It has very little.
President Lincoln's secretary was named Miss Kennedy. Kennedy's secretary was named Miss Lincoln. Both, as, both were assassinated by Southerners. Both were succeeded by Southerners. <clears throat> Andrew Johnson, who succeeded Lincoln, was born in 1808. Lyndon Johnson, who succeeded Kennedy, was born in 1908. John Wilkes Booth, who assassinated Lincoln, was born in 1839. Lee Harvey Oswald, who assassinated Kennedy, 1939. Both assassins were known by three names, John Wilkes Booth, Lee Harvey Oswald. Both names are comprised of 15 letters. President Lincoln was shot in a theater named Ford. Kennedy was shot in a car named Lincoln. <laughs> Made by Ford. John Wilkes Booth ran to a theater and was caught in a warehouse. Oswald ran from a warehouse and was caught in a theater. Booth and Oswald were both assassinated before they could go to trial. And a week before Lincoln was shot, he was in Monroe, Maryland. A week before Kennedy was shot, he was with Marilyn Monroe. <laughs> I read you that to impress upon your minds that there is an occult world going on around you. The men in power in this world that we live in are there by divine appointment. So when you hear the term, <clears throat> the divine right of kings, you better look at that. Because there is such a thing as a divine lineage going on throughout the world that most people just hear and have no comprehension of the implications of our governmental systems over the earth. <clears throat> I'm nowhere near being an authority on anything. I've never been the world's foremost authority on any subject. I feel that I am an ordinary man pursuing extraordinary knowledge. As ill-informed as I have been and am now, I'm smart enough to know that there is a God in the universe. There is a divine presence in the universe that men have called God. But I'm also very much aware that men's minds have misused and abused the spirit. And the sacred will allow you to do whatever it is you're going to do, but there is a time that what goes around comes around. And I am warning my audience to keep in mind that there is a spiritual matrix, a dynamics that's at work in this world today, and there are events coming upon the inhabited earth that men are falling into heart attacks and traumas because they are understand what is about to happen on the face of the earth. We are in some momentous times, and I believe the spirit of the high, of the God, is operating in mankind today. What I'm saying is that we are in for some interesting times, because the powers that be on this earth are vying for power. <clears throat> and again, let's go back to the concept of words and terms, and. <clears throat> how they affect us. Let me give you an example. Corpus Juris Secundum is an encyclopedic set, huge, maybe a hundred volumes or more, in our good law library. Corpus Juris Secundum is the complete restatement of the entire American law as reported in all cases. Anything that you would call American law is in Corpus Juris Secundum, period. <clears throat> Under attorney and client, Corpus Juris Secundum says, under the heading of attorney and client, an attorney has an obligation to the courts and to the government no less significant than his obligation to his clients. Thus, an attorney occupies a dual position that imposes dual obligations. <clears throat> his first duty is to the courts and to the government and not to his client. And whatever duty is his client, may conflict with those he owes as an officer of the court, the former must yield to the latter. So if you hire an attorney and you don't like what, what's happening in the court, then you've got nothing to say about it. 
period. <clears throat> a client is one who applies to an attorney or a lawyer or a counselor for advice in the direction of question of law. So if you hire an attorney, you will become known as a client. A client is also called, quote, a ward of the court, end quote, in regard to his relationship with his attorney. So if you hire an attorney, you're, in a, you're a client. And if you're a client, the law says you are a ward of the court. Why is this important? Because in Block's Law Dictionary, it says a ward of the court is an infant or a person of unsound mind. <clears throat> Basically meaning if you hire an attorney, you're an idiot. <laughs> Why? Because if you had any sense, you wouldn't be in court to start with. Why do we have a court? You play basketball and tennis on a court. How do you play tennis on a court? With a racket. Why? The whole thing's a racket. You think they use these terms by chance? You better go back and do your homework. There's something bigger going on here. I'll talk about courts in a minute. <clears throat> One of my favorite subjects is law. I know nothing about it, but I'm, I'm fascinated with it. In a law dictionary, you talk about being human. You know, well, I have human rights. The Human Rights Commission. You know what the word human means in law dictionary? Hue is a word for color. So you're a colored person. Hue, man. You look up the word hue, man, in a law dictionary, and it says, see, monster. Law dictionary, not Jordan Maxwell. See, monster. Okay, and look up the word monster. A monster is a human being by birth and in some parts resembling a lower animal, a monster, having no inheritable blood and cannot be an heir to any land. <clears throat> so much for being a human being. Um, and of course that is the way the superior authorities on the earth view the human family. And I have for many years um, <clears throat> made myself known around the world as being a revolutionary radical thinker. I have a lot of problems with government and t tyranny, totalitarian fascism. Uh, like Indiana Jones said in uh, the, uh, one of his movies, I don't like Nazism. I don't like Nazis. I don't like tyranny. I don't believe the God that created us divinely uh, ordained us to be in chains. I think that the human spirit has always and will always rise above petty politics. But I also understand, I may not agree with necessarily, but I do understand the thinking of powerful men who look upon the masses um, as nothing but a, a bunch of sheep. Because in point of fact, too many of us act like that. <clears throat> in the book 1984, George Orwell, um, that was published in 1948, um, let's see, who was it that did the four words? There was a quote. There was a quote in the 1984 original edition that said this, as political, as quote, as political and economic freedom diminishes, I'm sorry, it was uh, Aldous Huxley, Julian Huxley. Julian Huxley uh, said this in 1984 book. As political and economic freedom diminishes, sexual freedom tends compensatingly to increase. And the dictator, unless he needs cannon fodder or families with which to colonize the empty and conquered territories, will do well to encourage that freedom in conjunction with the freedom to daydream under the influence of narcotics, the movies, the radio, and it will now help his, to reconcile his subjects to the servitude which is now their fate. So the people who run this world know that most people are, couldn't care less about truth. America is not the land of the free and the home of the brave. We're not free or brave. Need to wake up and find out we're just here. 
The people who founded this country were men that we can't even converse with. They used a whole different terms and different logic. They were men of renown, brilliant, intelligent men who were students of history. And of course they made enemies in England, but they had the respect of the British kings and the respect of the British uh, royalty. They may not have loved them, but they respected them because they were brilliant, intelligent men. Unfortunately, our country today has very few, if any, on those qualities left. <clears throat> Let me give you an example of how people play with your minds. In television, you have something called the Emmys. The Emmys are, they come out of Washington, D.C., and um, unfortunately, I forgot to put down what this was, this name is, but the the acronym is NATAS, National Association, National Academy of Television Arts and Sciences. Yes, NATAS, National Academy of Television Arts and Sciences, puts out the Emmys each year. NAT, NATAS, go backwards. S A T A N, okay? I don't believe in Satan as a devil. It's not an article of my faith, but I do believe that there is a profound presence of dark power on the earth. The word devil is simply the word evil with a D in front of it. And the word God comes from a German word, goth, which the root gives us the root word for good. You take an O out of good and it becomes God. And God is good and devil is evil. Um, you need to understand that words and terms are divinely put into a flow so that your mind can accept concepts. I don't accept anything. I want to know, Christians are called believers. I've often wondered why would anyone call themselves a believer? I mean, if you are on death row or if you, if you are being tried for a capital crime and your attorney uh, is going through the different uh, jurors and they come across someone and they ask you, do you know anything about this case? And you say, oh yes, I already have decided this guy is guilty and that's it. Well, they can't use you. Why? Well, because you're prejudiced. You haven't even heard the facts yet and you've already decided. So consequently, you are a believer. You believe that the person is guilty, which obviously shows you, have, you do not have an open mind. You are not very well read and consequently cannot be trusted to make any kind of a decision. And consequently, today, in religion throughout the world, uh, unfortunately, they are believers. Why? Because they, not, they don't know anything. They are believers. Once you understand what words mean, the very word church is a classic example. We have Christians talking about uh, Christ, having no idea in the world what the word Christ means. Uh, how would you know an antichrist if you don't even know what the word Christ means? Christ comes from a Greek word, Christos, which gives us Pillsbury Crisco. Crisco is a cooking oil. That's what Christos or Christ means, oil. Therefore, Jesus the Christ is Jesus the oil, Jesus the Christos. <clears throat> the Christos, the oil, yes, because oil, you ask any Christian, why is Jesus called the Christ? They will tell you because he was the anointed. Why? Because even in the British um, uh, tradition today, the king and queen is anointed in the head with holy oil. interesting symbols, I suspect. Why, um, why were the ancient kings, not only in Israel, but throughout the ancient world, always anointed in the head with holy oil? Well, it has to do with Yahweh. Jehovah, Yahweh, the God of the Hebrews. Yahweh is not the name, it's not a proper name. Yahweh is a descriptive term. It's describing something. 
The best way to illustrate what Yahweh is describing is to take a garden hose and bend the nozzle, bend the hose at the nozzle, <clears throat> turn on the water and feel the pressure building up in the hose. When you release the hose, the water does not pour out, it blows out. And it's an extraordinary release of energy. And that extraordinary e uh, release of dynamic energy was pinned up, that is released, is referred to in the ancient Phoenician world as Yahweh. The dynamic release of energy, Yahweh. That word was used in relation to sex, period. The release of dynamic energy from the male into the female because only God can create life. That's right, that's what the woman does. And consequently, Yahweh is connected directly to the sex act. <clears throat> this is why Jewish physicists tell us the whole universe came into existence with a big bang. <laughs> you need to do your homework on words and terms. You will find that there's an extraordinary ignorance among the people of this world in relation to theology and religion. I talked about the word church. A lot of people do not know that the word church, an English word, go to the, as a matter of fact, you might want to keep this in mind. Um, go to any good library and do a lot of reading in the Oxford Dictionary of the English Language. Very important set of books. The word church, English word, goes back to a Scottish word, kirk. Kirk is church in Scottish which is why you have um, a television show with Captain Kirk, the good ship Enterprise. That's what Kirk is, Enterprise. Money, political power. <clears throat> the very word priest, uh, well, let me finish with church, because there's more to it. Church uh, goes back, as I said, to a Scottish word, Kirk, but Kirk can be traced back to a, Ro a Roman goddess named Circe. Um, Circe in Rome can be traced back to a Greek goddess, Circe. She was called Mother Circe. I'm not making this up. Mother Circe in the ancient Greek was uh, known as an enchantress. She was able to hypnotize people, bring them into her house, turn them into pigs, and eat them, and live off of them. And this is what has happened today. Mother Circe, Mother Circe, Mother Kirk, Mother Church has hypnotized nations and people to come into her house, turn them into animals to be used as cannon fodder for wars throughout the world, and live off of them. I had an FBI agent in 1989 call me from San Diego, and he said, Jordan, this is a social call, not a business. I'm calling you to tell you that the FBI has been watching you for many years. We're following everything you say and do, but I want you to know, <clears throat> as a social call, that your government at this time, and that was in 89, your government at this time does not consider you to be a threat. Uh, however, if people begin to, because they're hearing you, but if people begin to listen to you, <laughs> and you begin to grow in popularity, uh, the established order is going to have to take another look at you. And <clears throat> Your government is not concerned too much about what you do because you do not advocate ever taking up arms or in any way overthrowing government. Uh, and so we, even at the FBI, are interested in how you do and what you do. But he said to me, however, there will come a time that if you continue to expose the church, there will come a time when they will have had enough of you and they will deal with you. And his words to me were, the church in America, unfortunately in the rest of the world, is organized crime. At its highest levels, it is high politics. 
major money. And any time you've got major money and profound effect on that and masses of people, you've got to know you have organized crime. And then when you see the criminals, which you can watch on, they're not even criminals actually in America. We have dopes. And these dingbats who are on television, who are promoting their, Christ, their brand of Christianity, have no concept of the foundations of real Christianity. Unfortunately, they're making millions of dollars soaking the public because it's an entertainment affair. It has nothing to do with truth. As a matter of fact, if you go to the dictionary, an ordinary dictionary, look up the word priest. It comes from a Greek word <coughs> meaning a head or the head of uh, cattle, basic meaning the leader of the herd of cows. This is in a dictionary. So if you're a priest, you're leading cows, you're leading the herd. Um, again, I just believe that looking at words and terms and symbols is extraordinarily important because for the first time you will discover how much you didn't know. And I'm sure that uh, probably many of you have heard of the Celtic Druids. The Druid system in Europe has dominated all of, most all of Europe. It even influenced the thinking in Eastern Europe, but it dominated Western Europe. <clears throat> and it dominates America. And um, one of the most important symbols in the Druid religion, and it wasn't, wasn't just a religion, it was a governmental, theological, governmental uh, system at work in Europe. Uh, and one of the most important symbols in Druidism was a magic wand, like Merlin the magician with his magic wand. Well, magic wands were always made out of the wood of a holly tree. It was always made out of Hollywood. And today, there's a lot of magic going on in Hollywood. <clears throat> the people who run Hollywood are many things. I know I've lived there for some 40 years. I have been friends with many of the people in Hollywood. And I have noticed that there are many things, but stupid is not one of them. There are brilliant people who are on the cutting edge of intellectual acumen. And they're telling you a lot of things in movies. We watch things like uh, Indiana Jones <coughs> and Raiders of the Lost Ark. Profound stuff, I suggest. Because Steven Spielberg is many things, but stupid isn't one of them. I know the lady from England who is in charge of his uh, personal library at SKG have gone up to visit her. And from what I was able to see, Steven Spielberg has a personal library that would blow your mind. It's an incredible uh, collection of brilliant reference works in the ancient world and religions, etc. But um, when you begin to look at the stories, look at this. America wants the lost ark. And they're sending the best man they've got, Indiana Jones. And why? It's because they know the Nazis are looking for the lost ark. And anything the Nazis are looking for, America wants first. Because the Nazis are not stupid either. And if the Nazis are looking for, and Hitler wants the lost ark, it must be important. And if it's that important, then America wants it instead of Nazis. So consequently, Indiana Jones is sent to find the lost ark. Where does he go first? Well, the same place the Nazis go first, obviously, to Tibet. Northern India, Tibet, remember? Why Tibet? And he finds the Nazis are already there. They're looking for the key to the lost ark also. Now, in the movie, the metaphor and the symbol is, of course, this little a crystal that's going to point to exactly where the ark is. But it's a metaphor. Tibet is important in the understanding of the lost ark. And then after they, they get the key, what's the next place that the Nazis and Indiana Jones go? They go to the Holy Land, to Israel. No. 
They went to Egypt. Why Egypt? There's a reason why England, uh, France and Germany, and America, but mostly France, Germany, and England have been busy spending huge sums of money over the past 150 years in excavations in Egypt. Why do you think Lord Carnarvon financed the, uh, the expeditions into Egypt and looking for lost tombs, etc.? All of this has a mystique of Indiana Jones, but in point of fact, there's something very serious going on here because these people in England, France, and Germany that finance these expeditions are looking for something. And it's not the pretty artifacts to show the children in a museum. The men who run this world know that there's something very serious going on on the planet. Tibet plays a very important part. And, and Egypt plays a very important part. You better go back and look at the megalithic architecture around the world, from the pyramids to Stonehenge. And Stonehenge itself used the same measurements that was used on the pyramid, the Great Pyramid of Giza. If you've never been in the Great Pyramid of Giza, I will tell you it's an extraordinary experience. I laid in the king's sarcophagus and was blessed in a ritual by a Chemite priest. It's an extraordinary experience seeing that much of massive building and only until one has been to Egypt and been privy to see the temples uh, do you begin to understand how much America has not been told. There are extraordinary things in Egypt. And it has nothing to do with the people who live there today. It has nothing to do with the Arab population that live there today. We're talking about ancient Egyptians. And we're not talking about two or three thousand years ago. We're talking serious ancient. And when you begin to see the statues and the, and the temples and the profound beauty and the dynamics of the architecture, one is struck with the, with the overwhelming feeling of awe. This is the work of the gods. Well, I wouldn't be a bit surprised if they're here now with us. I'm totally convinced that when the Bible talks about, come let us make man in our image after our likeness, I talked to Rabbi, I'll not use his name, I talked to a Rabbi as far back as 1965, 64, who at that time was the head of the American Rabbinical Association, some large organization in America, of Jewish rabbis, <clears throat> and I asked him about that quote, come let us make man in our image after our likeness. And he said that there are many ways to read the Bible, of course, but a correct reading of that uh, particular scripture in Genesis does not say God created man. As a matter of fact, the entire Old Testament does not say God created man. Period. But what it does say is, come let us make man in our image, after our likeness. Not create man, man's already here. So it is a recreation of a creature which is indigenous here, which is already here, which implies someone had the power to intervene in our evolution. Someone from somewhere said, come, let us take the creatures which are here and elevate the entire species and let them, let them ultimately be in our image after our likeness. And then later on in Genesis, it goes on to say <clears throat> that here man has become as one of us. What do you mean one of us? Knowing good and evil. I believe it is an article of my faith that for whatever you might wish to call these entities, the Bible refers to them as sons of God. Uh, sons of God, incidentally, are not angels. You need to understand there's different words, and the reason why there are different words in the Bible because they mean different things. There's a world of difference between an angel and a sons of God. 
and the watchers. These words are not there to fill out pages. They're telling you something. Angels are one thing. Sons of God are able, we are told, to uh, materialize in human form and cavort with women and get them pregnant. It shows their plumbing worked. And consequently, if they're able to have offspring through women, I, can, um, I cannot imagine a woman being talked into bed by some hideous creature from another world, but I can believe she might be talked into bed by a very handsome, good-looking man who is not human. He just looks human. And you better go back and do your homework. This guy walks through walls. Consequently, I believe, as an article of my faith, that there are individuals on the earth today who are, for a lack of a better term, divinely ordained in their position of power. And I don't know if that makes me happy or not, but I'm smart enough to accept it and realize that, I guess for a lack of a better way of saying it, someone has to run the world. And if they are here, and they have come here from another place and another time, um, they have extraordinary wisdom, power, and knowledge. And um, consequently, I don't see them, if this be true, this is just an article of my belief, but if this be true, that there are entities here who are not completely human, but who are a combination of the divine and human, then um, I see no problem with this. I accept that there are powers over us. And um, I think that they uh, will reward you for your diligence and your intelligence. If you intend to be stupid, then let them. So consequently, I think that what's going on in the world today, um, and, and, it's, and it's unfortunate because there's some very serious things happening in the world today, and I'm not sure where it's all going, but I am sure of one thing, that we are leaving an old dispensation, an old period of time, and we are entering a new dispensation, for a lack of a better term. We're entering into a new time on the evolution of man. Um, I believe that man is not just evolving. Mankind is mutating, I think is a better word. You might want to look up a word. I'm going to give you some terms to do some research on. Look up the word new man, N-E-W-M-A-N, the new man. This is why certain names like Paul Newman or Harry Friedman or Harry Freeman. <clears throat> free man implies that you were born to a family who are considered free, so therefore your last name is Freeman. Or if you were born into a slave family and have obtained your freedom, you become Harry Friedman. If you are now a part of the mutation of the human family into what is called the new man, you can have a name like Harry Newman, okay? New man. Adolf Hitler talked about the new man. You need to look at that word and the terms and the implications thereof. <clears throat> I believe that the church and religion in general in the Western world, which is to say Judaism and Christianity, have given to the world much good and has been beneficial. But like any and all technologies and thinking, it has also brought with it many things which have hurt the human family. And so I think that this is why the human family is being mutated. I think we're being brought into a new world that you are not going to recognize in the next 20 to 50 years. I think this is going to be necessary because the way we're going now, uh, our world is out of control. The violence and the hatred among peoples is going to have to be done away with. We're going to have to do something about the facts of life. 
the facts of life is that the other people are on this earth and you didn't put them there. Other people are on this earth because the God who created life has allowed all of us to be here and somewhere along the line there's got to be order on this planet. And I believe that there are certain individuals are ordained to make sure that happens. So I don't have any problem with power. I have problems with people who misuse power. But those people who have the power to do something for the good of mankind, I am sure that they are working around the clock taking care of their business. Um, <clears throat> again, I go back to the concept of uh, consensus reality. Don't ever just accept anything on its face. I have, first of all, I have no, let me say this publicly, I have no respect for the skeptic society, period. Because I don't like religion, period. I'm interested in truth. And anyone who gets paid financially, gets paid to be a skeptic, doesn't impress me. Um, people who call themselves scientists, and they're doctors, they have PhDs, that doesn't impress me either. All of Hitler's top Nazis were all doctors, PhDs, Dr. Mengele, who murdered children. So I'm not impressed with doctors. I'm not impressed with government. I'm not impressed with mankind. I'm impressed with the foundations, the ancient foundations of the human family and where we're going as a species on this earth. And I realize that there's some serious things going on in this world that we need to look at. <clears throat> Where is the United States? You ask any uh, American today, where is the United States located? Well, that's silly. Oh, is this silly? You think so? Do you know where the United States is located? <clears throat> because you need to understand there's a world of difference between the United States and America as a country. In 1870s, 1878 to be exact, there was a privately owned corporation incorporated called United States Corporation. And it was stipulated in the corporation papers that anyone who would work for that particular corporation would be called a citizen, not an employee. It's a privately owned corporation. It was referred to as United States. So today, if you're conducting business in this country <clears throat> and someone asks you if you're a citizen of the United States and you say yes because you perceive the question is are you lawfully in this country to do business and you say yes, they didn't ask you if you were a citizen of America. They didn't ask you if you were lawfully in America. According to international maritime admiralty law, they ask you a question. Are you of your own volition, out of your own mouth, testifying that you are a citizen of the United States? The United States is a privately owned corporation. It's a privately owned company. And if you say, yes, I am a United States citizen, now that makes you an employee of a privately owned foreign corporation. <coughs> The United States, the word, very word United States means, quote, the Philippines, American Samoa, Guam, Puerto Rico, Virgin Islands, and the Northern Mariana Islands, period. So when you use the word United States, that's what it means. The corporation headquarters is in Washington, D.C. You also need to understand that Maryland is Mary Land. And that Virginia gives us that word virgin or vagina. Virginia, virgin, Mary Land. The two together is a center of power, Virgin Mary. Virginia, Mary Land. What, is the, what does this have to do with anything? Well, that's the center of power in America under the Virgin Mary. <clears throat> you need to look at the Vatican. Once you begin to look at the Vatican, now it's going to get serious. Because you need to remember that the Pope has dominated Europe.
for some 1,600 years. And Europe has dominated the world for 1,600 years. And our American system is a Vatican system. We live under the Vatican in this country. <clears throat> the, uh, the Vatican system, of course, is based on the ancient Roman system. And in Rome, the seat of power for Caesar was called Capitol Hill. And so every morning, Caesar would go up on the hill, Capitol Hill. Capital is a Latin word for money. You either have the capital or you don't. And consequently, in the Capitol Hill, Caesar would meet with the Senate. That's what we have, the Senate. The symbols of the ancient Roman Senate were two fasces crossed the crossing of the fasces. That's the symbol of the United States Senate, crossing of the fasces. When you see the President of the United States standing and speaking to an audience in the, in the room where the podium and then the, the Speaker of the House and the Vice President sit behind him, watch that uh, on the news every night. Somebody's always making a speech in that room. Um, when you see someone making a speech in that room, Look on both sides of the podium. Don't look at the person talking. Look at the symbols. For many will look with their eyes but not see, and will listen with their ears but not hear, and with the heart not get the sense of it. You need to open your eyes and look at the symbols on both sides of the podium, which is about an eight or nine foot high fasci, call a fasci, a bundle of sticks with a hatchet head the symbol of royal power in Rome. Our system is under Rome. It doesn't matter what you think of the Roman Catholic Church. It doesn't matter what you think of the religion of the Roman Catholic Church. All you need to know is your country is dominated by the Pope, period. You've got a problem with that? Consequently, when you begin to look at the way our government operates and the words that are used and the symbols, you begin to see that the most powerful law in the world, and let me explain to you this, there are two basic kinds of law on the earth. One is called civil law. It goes back to a Latin word, civili. The ilias were, in the ancient world, the gods. Civili means the people of God. So we have something called civil law. Civil law is a law of the land, but in every country the land is different, so that you can do things in America you can't do in Russia. You can do things in China you can't do in Africa, because the civil law is based on the culture of the people who live on the land. But there's a far, far more powerful law that the kings and the powerful men of this planet live by, and it has nothing to do with civil law. It's called the law of water. Because on the earth, there's only two things, land and water. There's three times more water than there is earth, so the law of water is three times more powerful than the law of civil law. It's called the law of the high seas, the law of water. This is why the Vatican is called the Holy Sea. The, the sea is considered holy by the masters of this planet, the waters of the earth. And consequently, <clears throat> based on that idea that the law of the sea is the most powerful law on the earth, it's referred to as banking law. The law of money is the law of the sea, the cash flow. And once you understand that you can get a credit card in China and use it in Africa, you can get a, you know, open up a bank account in New Zealand and use it in Alaska. Why? Because it's banking. And now you're talking money. And consequently, money is run around the world in one operation. Banking is one thing. Once you understand that the law of the land is the people's law of their culture, but the law of money is called the law of water. This is why, incidentally, the Statue of Liberty could not be put on American land. It was put in a harbor, because the Statue of Liberty is a maritime admiralty symbol. It's a symbol of, it's called the Statue of Liberty, not the Statue of Freedom. 
There's a world of difference between freedom and liberty. Liberty means you ask your father if you can use the car. If he says no, you don't use it. Liberty is what a sailor gets when he pulls into harbor. He asks the captain if he can leave. If the captain says yes, and he most likely is not going to, but if he says yes, that means you have the liberty. You pull liberty. You don't have freedom. America is not the land of the free and the home of the brave. We're not free or brave. We're ill-informed, entertained, and totally ignorant to the powers that be on this earth and how it works. <clears throat> but uh, let me give you an example of how the law of water works. When you go into a court, why do you have to go to court? As I said, you play tennis and basketball on a court. The whole idea in a court is to put the ball back in the other guy's court. So consequently, this team stands up and throws the ball at that team, and that team stands up and throws the ball back over there, and the judge sits here, and that's what he is, a judge. He's the referee. He doesn't care who wins or loses. Somebody's going to pay. And he's going to get paid, so he doesn't care who wins or loses. He's only there to make sure that the game is played correctly. It's called commerce because the whole world is commerce. Look up the word commerce in a law dictionary. It'll tell you sexual intercourse. Marriage is a partner. Partner is a term that's used in business. And consequently, if your business with your partner doesn't work out, you're not going to God, you're going to court. And bring your, bring your check and your, and your house and all your property with you, because it's just business, nothing personal. Consequently, <clears throat> I'll give you an example of how this works. Uh, when a ship pulls into a harbor, you need to understand the concept behind international banking. As a matter of fact, the judge rules from a bench in a courtroom. He rules from the bench. He sits up higher so he can look down on you and you can look up to the law. And he sits on a bench. The bench, word bench is simply a, uh, a Latin word for a bank. So he rules for the bank. This is why he wears a black robe. But because the black robe in ceremonial black robes represent the planet Saturn. Saturn is the god of law, order, and banking. The inhibitor, the one who can put you in jail, can inhibit your business. Saturn, he's referred to as Lord of the Rings. Hollywood's still making movies about Lord of the Rings, and Americans just love it and have no idea in the world what they're looking at. They're telling you something, but you're not listening. So Saturn is the Lord of the black robe. Judges wear black robes. Catholic priests wear black robes. Rabbis wear black robes. Used to, kids graduating from high school and university wear a black robe. Black robes are the robes of the planet Saturn. Saturn was color, was black. The god Saturn <clears throat> in the ancient Phoenician world was referred to as El, E-L. This is why if you're continuing today to worship the planet Saturn, you become known as an elder. How did you get to be an elder? You got elected with elections. Because you were elected, now you're one of the elites. You have become elevated. Consequently, <clears throat> words and terms are very, very interesting. Again, we go back to the court and back to maritime admiralty law, the law of banking. Um, I want you to understand the concept behind banking. Banking is referred to, as I said, the law of water. A, uh, an example is if a large ship from Japan pulls in and parks at the harbor, it's got $700 million worth of Toyotas or TVs on it. The ship was not here yesterday. It has come this morning, so it has manifested. So every single piece on that ship that's going to make money for somebody has to be accounted for. So the captain, which represents capital money, the captain <clears throat> um, has to report to the port authorities all of the vital signs on every single thing sold and brought into this country. Is it a four-door, two-door? Does it have air conditioning, six-cylinder, what? 
every single piece has to have what is called a certificate of manifest. Because it wasn't here yesterday, it's manifested. So you have to have a certificate of manifest with all the vital signs on it. Why? Because it's, it's money and it has to be kept track of. And when the ship pulls in and parks, it sits in its berth. All ships are referred to as she. There's a reason why. The ship sits in her berth and it's tied to the dock. Consequently, these, these items are coming in on water. Money is changing hands. Maritime admiralty, banking law. <clears throat> now, it's a curious fact that, in point of fact, when you were born, you came out of your mother's water. Her water broke. You came down the birth canal. And when her water broke, uh, you came out and you were birthed because the ship sits in her birth. It's birthing a ship. And consequently, you have to have a birth certificate. And if you're taking a, a, a car off the ship and it drops and falls, now you've lost money. But that's all right because the system uh, allows for breakage. So you have to have a death certificate uh, signed by the dock. The dock has to sign your death certificate, right? <clears throat> so you need to understand that you are a maritime admiralty product. You came out of your mother's water. You are a human resource. You need to understand the way banking and world government works. Again, I don't have any problem with this because there's no need to have a problem with it. This is the way the world has worked for at least 6,000 or more years. All I'm saying is that when you need, you need to understand that words and terms and symbols are used in religion, churches. Why do you, why do you have uh, Jews going to synagogue? Uh, in this country, it's spelled S-Y-N-A, synagogue. No, that's incorrect. In Israel, it's spelled correctly, S-I-N-A. In the ancient uh, world, there was a, in Arabia, there was a mountain called the Mountain of the Moon, a Mountain of the Moon God. Even in uh, Africa today, in Uganda, there's a uh, Mountain of the Moon. Um, the Moon God in Arabia was called Sin, S-I-N. You can look that up in an encyclopedia. S-I-N was not doing something evil. It was the name of a god, the god of the moon, Sin. In the ancient Arabic language, A-I was a mountain. You put the two together, it's the god of the mountain, was Sin, A-I, or Sinai. Mount Sinai is the god of the mountain, the moon god. This is why Moses was a leader of a lunar cult. Uh, in the Vatican and throughout Europe, Moses is pictured in sculpture and paintings with horns. These were the lunar horns. It's because the Jews uh, celebrate their holy days after sundown. Well, of course, that's when the moon comes out. And consequently, uh, the Bible even starts off in Genesis. This was the evening and the morning. So days are counted in the Jewish tradition from the evening to evening. Why? Because of sin, Ai or the god of the, the moon. Uh, fascinating use of terms and words, as I said. You need to understand that once you begin to see how the laws and regulations of the world are put into place, there, the implication of the theological foundations of the world are so profoundly deep, go back so far into ancient history. You need to understand that the concepts in our mind of religion actually need to be, uh, you need to define the terms where these things come from. Uh, let's go back in, uh, for a few moments to the uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark. Again, <clears throat> why were the Nazis looking for the Lost Ark? Uh, also, I don't know if any of you caught this in Indiana Jones, but um, there was a Frenchman leading the Nazis in their pursuit of the Lost Ark. What was this Frenchman all about? Why was he the authority and the Nazis were following him? Well, it has to do with something called the French Grand Orient Temple Masonry. It has to do with the French are not stupid either. As a matter of fact, France is probably the depository the largest depository of the occult literature of the world in the Louvre Museum. 
the French have been for many, many centuries on top of the world of the occult, use of power, words and terms. This is why the French language has been the diplomatic language of use throughout the world. There's something going on in France. Paris is called the city of lights. Paris comes from Paris, par Isis. Par Isis becomes Paris, the city of lights, the illumination, intellectual, spiritual illumination. So again, Indiana Jones, why are the Nazis looking for the lost ark? Why are both the Americans and the, and the Germans and the French looking for the lost ark in Egypt? What's going on in Egypt? What's going on in Sinai? There is a huge story yet to come out, and I believe that eventually the entire superstructure of Western civilization is going to crumble. That's my personal opinion. I believe the entire superstructure of religious, political thinking is going to mutate rather soon, and no one is going to be able to do anything about it because there is, as I said before, a God force that is operating in the universe and it has its own agenda. And consequently, I also believe as an article of my faith that there are very powerful men in this world, powerful people, who are on both sides of the spectrum, very powerful and very evil, and very powerful and very good, because in all mankind is good and evil. And I believe that we are now seeing a struggle between the powers that have dominated this world for thousands of years. And I think that if you're going to be of any value to the human family, you had better start educating yourself to the spiritual implications and the spiritual dynamics of world politics. Who are you and where did you come from and why are you here? And begin to look at the simple things of life. How did you even get here? I mean, what is sex? Uh, what, what, is, what is the... Uh, what is the connection between water, electricity, and the human life? Where did we come from, and what is the ultimate goal of the creation of the human family? And consequently, you, you begin saying, my God, these are the same questions the great thinkers of the ages have been asking. Well, I think very soon, the gods, the Elohim in the Hebrew, the gods, and again, this is a, I could talk about this stuff all night, in Genesis 1, 1, it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. But that's not what it says in the original Hebrew. It doesn't say in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. It says, in the beginning, Elohim created the heavens and the earth. Elohim is plural. It's in the feminine, and it's plural. It means more than one. And the second one, the second, Genesis 1, 2, is even more important. It says, and the earth was without form and void. No, that's not what it says in Hebrew. It says, the earth was without, without form and void. The correct translation was, the earth became a waste and a desolation. There's only, and the words is tohu vohu in Hebrew. Tohu vohu is only used twice in the Bible in the Old Testament. Only twice. Tohu vohu means became a waste and a desolation. In Genesis 1-2, it is used in Jeremiah where the prophet Jeremiah says, I had a vision from God of the earth when it was a meeting place for the gods and there was no man. And then tohu vohu, and then it became a waste and a desolation. You say, whoa, what are we talking about here? Jeremiah saw the earth when it was a meeting place for the gods and then it became a waste and a desolation, the implications are horrendous. Because in Genesis 9, 1, God says to Noah and his family uh, after the flood, God says, go forth, multiply, and replenish the earth. And I've asked the rabbis and checked on it, and replenish the earth is correct. Re means do again. Why? Well, because everyone died in the flood, so you have to repopulate the earth. 
But go back to Genesis 2.28 where God is creating Adam and Eve and he says the same exact words. Go forth, multiply, and replenish the earth. Do it again. So what we're talking about is the same thing Jeremiah is talking about. I, Jeremiah says, I saw in a vision the earth when it was a meeting place for the gods. And then it became a waste and a desolation. I believe that there is no doubt in my mind that this world has been inhabited for perhaps millions of years. And the powers that be on this earth are connected to that lineage going back thousands and thousands of years into a world that you have never known. And somewhere along the line, I believe those powers are going to make themselves known to us. And when that happens, it's going to be an awesome event because the way these uh, entities, for lack of a better term, the way these gods work is that they're very slow. They're in no hurry. When you're in control, there is no need to be in a hurry. You don't have to impress anyone or show anyone anything. When you get ready to move, the world will know it. And I believe that this is exactly what is coming now. I believe we're getting ready to see the powers of this world shaken. The prophecies in the Bible are merely one of the many different prophecies. The Aztecs, the Mayas, the Toltecs of uh, the Incas, my God, all over the world, the ancient texts have told us there's going to come a time when in our language, in America, we would say what goes around comes around. And I believe that the divine presence in the universe, these entities that the Hebrews have called the Elohim, the gods, I believe they're going to very soon make their presence known. I think that Hollywood has known that. I think that uh, even the concepts that are given to us in the motion pictures and science fiction movies are trying to tell you something. I think that Area 51, 51, May 1st, May Day, 5, 1. What is May Day? Why did, why did the communists celebrate May Day? It's because even the American military, when you're in trouble, it was a May Day call. What are you talking about, May Day? You better go back and look at symbols. You better go back and look at the words and terms on which this whole world is based. Um, I think we're getting ready for a time in which the mutation of the human family is going to be orchestrated by the powers that have brought us here to start with. And we're going to come face to face with the gods. We're going to come face to face, there's no doubt in my mind, with a presence that is going to be overwhelming I had such a, an experience. I had an epiphany of my own. I uh, was out on the desert with two of my friends um, north of uh, Area 51, and it was about 1 o'clock in the morning, and it was totally overcast. Couldn't see anything. Turned the lights off in the car, and it's totally dark. We're 155 miles north of Las Vegas, 1 o'clock in the morning out in the middle of nowhere. We get out of the car, and all of a sudden, just north of us, the clouds begin to open up, <clears throat> and two bluish-white glowing disks, the size that the moon would appear in the sky, not a little light zipping across, the size that the moon appears. Two bluish-white disks came through the clouds, and as they came through the clouds, they illuminated the clouds above them. They were awesome, is the only word I can think of. Behind them, five more came in. Seven bluish-white glowing disks, the size that the moon appears, and I was frightened to death. The two people with me were acting like they saw Santa Claus for the, same, for the first time. They jumped around and were delighted. They were happy. And I was frightened because I realized the implication of what I was seeing. I, have, I was born and raised in Gulf Breeze, Florida. <clears throat> At eight years old, I was having entities in my bedroom. My whole life has been filled with other world experiences, but I have never personally been involved in anything like this. Spirits in my bedroom are one thing. This was frightening. I don't know who these people are or what they represent or what they're going to do here, but I'm getting out of here. And consequently, 
It was a frightening experience. Seven bluish-white disks hovered over us and began to maneuver around, and I believe that this was given to us to, as a prelude to something which is coming. So when I'm asked, do you believe in UFOs, I can answer truthfully, no. I don't need to. I've seen them. I've had too many experiences, as I said, from, the, from my childhood of eight years old on up, I've had other world experiences. I've been involved in very strange and occult um, things which have happened, which are frightening. And that's why I have a legitimate fear of power. And that's why I don't mind submitting to things, people who are more powerful than I. I have no problem with that. I've even said to the gods that I'm willing to do whatever I'm supposed to do, but please don't abduct me. I don't want to go anywhere, and I don't want to wake up with something in my bedroom I can't handle. Don't frighten me. <laughs> don't frighten me. If I am to do something, then give me the work I am to do and show me what I am to do, and I will do the best to fulfill what I, my destiny is. But don't frighten me, because I am very frightened. I'm very, very fearful of the powers that rule this world, because they, they have the power of life and death in their hands. And I believe that they are picking individual people today according to their own design, according to their own agenda. And they are picking individuals today to help enlighten the whole human family. Because when they begin to make their move, they care nothing for what your, your views of anything are. They don't care what you think. They don't care how you view anything. You can have your own views of God. It doesn't matter. They're in charge. They've always been in charge. And when they get ready to make their move, you're going to know that what you thought was true wasn't true. And that's why <clears throat> when people say, well, all of this stuff about UFOs and extraterrestrials and paranormal is a bunch of bull, I always answer, you're probably right. You better hope to hell you're right. Because if you're wrong and you've made a miscalculation and this world is inhabited by powers that are unseen, you better find out if that's true. And if it is, you better get in tune with it because it's going to make its move soon. And I am so convinced, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that we are in a time in which the human family, again, is going to mutate. It's going to come face to face with the powers that be. And there's going to be a change in the affairs of mankind. And I am frightened because of the implications of this, because we're not ready. We're not a very well-read people. We're not very open-minded. I remember, I don't even know if I brought this out before, but I'm reminded of a quote that says, always trust a person looking for the truth. Don't ever trust the one who's found it. Again, there is something going on. There is a profound significance to the people who are on the cutting edge of intellectual achievement today. The work of people like, uh, uh, well, the writers and the authors and some of the people that are here today are on the cutting edge of a whole new technology of science, a whole new technology of power, and I do believe that individuals have been chosen to help the rest of the human family to progress and wake up and prepare yourself for what's coming. Because there's no doubt in my mind we're not going to continue the way we're going. We don't deserve freedom. We don't deserve to be treated as spiritual beings because we haven't acted like it. So in concluding, I would like to say that uh, one of the people I have had the pleasure of being in the company with, of, uh, was Zachariah Sitchin. And Zach and I have talked about these things many, many times in private. I actually had a business deal with Zachariah. I wanted to do a 13-week miniseries with him. And he was all for it. And we halfway through the project, and it fell through. But Zachariah is a very dear friend, and um, I did a private interview with Zachariah Sitchin. I said, Zach, I want to ask you my kind of questions. And so he, go, he agreed. And so uh, I'm now making it available, a private interview that I did with Zachariah Sitchin. Again, I want to thank all of you for listening to me. I do tend to ramble, 
but the reason why is because my interests are so varied. I'm fascinated by law, money, government, religion, theology, symbols, emblems, national coats of arms, flags, howardry, seals. I am fascinated with the world of the occult, the mystical world of power that has been around us from day one, and I think the human family is finally being brought into a position where we're going to see these, these things for the first time and appreciate the powers that be over us. And I want to thank you for being with me.